Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the series interview with an exorcist. My name is John Barnwell. I'm here in the greater Detroit metropolitan area with my oldest and best teacher and best pupil, Dr. Douglas Gabriel, who's resume I've shared a few times, and so no need to belabor the point. And we were, in the last episode, uh, on Douglas's adventure in Hawaii. And uh, But to kick this off, I'm going to share uh, a verse from the, the Kumulipo. At the time when the sun became hot, at the time when the heavens turned about, at the time when the sun was darkened to cause the moon to shine, the time of the rise of the Pleiades. And Pleiades play a very prominent role in, in the mythos of the, the fiery crescent, as they call it sometimes. And, and all these different cultures have uh, really a, a stellar orientation to the Pleiades. Even in Japan, they have the Subaru automobile. Well, Subaru is the Japanese word for the Pleiades and the logos, a picture of the Pleiades. So the seven sisters, you know, and so you can go into many ancient cultures and see that it has a prominent role and has, it's in the region of, uh, the horoscope sign of Taurus. So it ties very much into the inspiration of people during the age of Taurus that was coming out of the spirits of form. But since we've entered into this new era, now we're drawing our inspiration through Christ. And it's coming about through the realm of the archive that are just one step beyond the archangels. And the leader of which is Michael, the archangel of the sun, the great servant of Christ. And it's in the spirit of that that these messages are being shared. Hello, Douglas. Hello, John. That's true. I seldom ever give the credence to the archai Michael, who used to be an archangel and who leads our time since 1879. And it's very critical. And somehow uh, you bring up the Pleiades. Well, that is, as I was telling you before the show, that is what the uh, astral cartographer Dan told me was the guiding um, navigational point um, for the Polynesians when they sailed from, you know, Tahiti and the Polynesian Islands to Hawaii to begin with. Uh, supposedly, they don't really know somewhere between seven hundred and a thousand A.D. Uh, they got in these canoes and went across the ocean. But they, their story is they followed the great white shark. But what's the great white shark? It's probably their name for the Pleiades because that's what Dan had showed up many years after I met him in Hawaii. I'm giving a talk at the um, on Maui at the Waldorf School, at the, at the uh, Haleakala Waldorf School. And he comes into this closed meeting with all these charts and stuff. And at the break, I go up and say, what, what are you doing here? How did they let you in? You, you don't have a tag? It's amazing. How did you get in here? He goes, I've been looking for you. I was over on the big island of Hawaii, and they said you were over here for a week doing this conference. So I came to tell you, you and John and Bob were right. What were we right about? He says, well, your astral cartography shows that the Polynesians are, are really the key to the whole thing, and that what is going to happen on July 11th, 1991, the total eclipse of the sun is one of the biggest moments in history because it's the end of their, what's called the great uh, platonic year or the uh, year of the goddess. 25,920 years is coming to an end. And uh, that was signified when King Kamehameha, King Kamehameha um, through the direction of the great prophet or called the star teacher, whose other name is uh, Kapukani, uh, told King Kamehameha, we have to stop worshiping the old war god of Ku and start worshiping the new god of agriculture and life and the goddess uh, Lono. And uh, he had, of course, from the moment that the Polynesians arrived on the, the Hawaiian Islands and Kauai and then went to 
uh, Oahu, Molokai, Maui, and the Big Island, Hawaii, they were at war, nonstop war. And by the time the British pirates got there, Captain Cook and his British pirates, there were a million people living there. You know how many of them they killed, either with diseases or just took them out and murdered them? They murdered all the kahunas that they could find, just murdered them. 800 one day, they just pulled them out into a field and killed them all. So it went from a million Hawaiians to 40,000. So this story we're going to talk about today, I experienced. I don't know if it's true what I was told. And until recently, like yesterday, uh, when I was uh, again researching these things and found things on the internet that I didn't know existed, even though I went through, I was studying this stuff, you know, I was a comparative religion student and I was studying the Hawaiian gods and all this. And I was deeply into it, trying to figure out, you know, the whole fierce nature of the Hawaiian gods and this transference from a war culture to a peace culture and how that happened. And um, some very strange things happened. Uh, as I had told you before, I had visited Hawaii a few times, once to see my um, friend, um, we'll call him Gary, on the Big Isle, I mean on Oahu, where Honolulu is, and the Kahumana community there with uh, Father Phil, I mentioned last time, and the uh, Mahalapua School, I did decided, oh yeah, I really like it. I, I might come back here, but I hate the city. This is a big city on a small island and I just hate it. So I like the Waimea side, the side that was undeveloped. And by the way, I just wanna correct that there is a road totally around Oahu now and another one around Maui. They've now completed them. I went on uh, Google where you can look down on these things and researched all this stuff in the last week or so since we started talking about this. And I found out all kinds of uh, in new information because I haven't focused on Hawaii for a long time. But anyway, I decided, yeah, I'll come back to uh, to the that school if, you know, if I need to. And then later I visited my friend, uh, we're calling him Gary, uh, when he, uh, excuse me, we vis I visited Ariel and uh, Aravinda on Maui and saw that school and loved it. That was a Waldorf school, Haleakala Waldorf school all these stars and millionaires and rich people live there. But the island was small, just like Oahu, and it gave me island fever in just the time that I was there. So I decided, you know, I'm not really convinced that either one of those two Waldorf schools or Kahumana would be a good place for me. So then when I finally uh, left Detroit and bought my around the world ticket, I went to visit my friend Gary on the big island and had, as I told you, two weeks of rain on one side and total desert on the other side of the island. The most amazing place I'd ever been. I kind of pretty much after I got the Vajrayogini full initiation and retreat with the head of the Saki tradition, the king and the queen head, as well as the Ludenkin Rinpoche, uh, who became my second root guru after Gaelic Rinpoche in Ann Arbor. Um, and I tried to meet the nature in Rinpoche, I, I, I decided, you know, I'm going to stay here. This is really cool. I don't have, I can cash in my around the world ticket anytime for a year. So I'm just going to hang out here for a year. So during that year, I helped found the Kauai Waldorf School, helped found the Kona Coast Waldorf School uh, uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii, and helped some other ventures. And I found out about the Malama Lama Waldorf School. Malama Lama being the light of knowledge. That's what that means. And I just love that. But I wasn't ready to settle down there. They kept begging me, oh, please, 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 you got to go. You got to come help us. None of us are trained. <clears throat> and coincidentally, there were 12 really nice, beautiful, young, wonderful, did I mention wonderful teachers there, none of whom were trained. So they were like, oh, please come train us. And so I started helping them a little bit and they kept begging me and begging me. And eventually I'll just tell you the bottom line. My friend Gary's best friend there was a, a, a millionaire at a family and he came up with, helped with the fifth grade and then finished sixth, seventh and eighth grade with someone at the same time I was the headmaster of the school, principal of the school. Now, are these the ladies that uh, gave you a moniker? Uh, the black sex magician? That is why I was called okay. the, the black sex magician, because Let's they thought I had them all in a spell. I never <laughs> dated a one of them. 
Not for one single and, second. And, and you notice in honor of our discussion for Hawaii today, we are all attired in our Hawaiian best. Um, this is as good as you can get in Michigan. And uh, Douglas, um, I think you have something that you want to show people. You know, his hair has been looking so great lately, John. Yes, have you uh, noticed? Today's show is brought to you by Sunny's Original Surf Paste with Surf Mate Paste. Hair, styling with Hawaiian black lava, sea salt, and sea kelp. You can't see it. There you go. Don't do this. Don't. Don't <laughs> these people who made this, they're they're burning in hell now. You don't take lava rock off the off the Hawaiian Islands. You must be out of your mind. Okay. But it's in my hair. And That's you right. bought and you bought some. Yeah, but I didn't break, I did not carry it off the island myself. I did not insult Pele and her children. Now look, let's get to the <clears throat> okay, Gary and blah 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 and, and all this kind of stuff. Let's get to the good stuff. I'm How ready. did you come to have the name the black sex magician down there in Hawaii with all these uh, running around? Anybody knows that somebody trained in wokeism, that's one of their principal lines of attack. It's 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 in all their uh, playbooks. I mean, you can even find it in in uh, Glitzen's New Lies for Old. I mean, that's you know uh, that's the oldest story in the book. So, anyways, we can toss that out. Oh, there's a reason it happened, dear Tyler. Okay, part of the story I didn't tell. Two of the main people who got me fired at Detroit Walter School was because a man and a woman who were teaching there, the woman, they must have, must have been having a marital problems because she started, every time her husband would come around, putting her hands on me, kissing me, touching me, stroking me. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> she'd keep doing this, right? Her husband would come around. She, I'd turn around. She'd kiss me. And it's like, stop this. So anyway, he quit. And he was an emotional wreck to begin with, but he quit. And I don't know why they were doing that, but to make me mad, he was the one who was my sponsor teacher who came and observed me once, left the classroom crying, wouldn't talk to me for a long time. And then later said, when I saw you teach, I realized that I had always done it wrong. And even now I'm doing it wrong. But anyway, he went to Hawaii before I did. You see, so they, he got to Hawaii. So he quit that school, left his wife and his children, <laughs> went to Hawaii. I predict he wouldn't last a year. He didn't last more than a few months until he had a nervous breakdown. And we had one friend there from the school that was my friend. And I was friends with other people there because of my business connection to all the Walder schools. But anyway, I couldn't go to that school because they were there. And they said horrible things about me all the time. But in the end, I ended up being the master teacher who came to their school, giving conferences at their school, and they wouldn't, wouldn't show up. But, you know, they hated me. And so they said, don't, don't hire him. He's a black sex musician, magician. Now, John would say, no, no. Go ahead, John. Give us your punchline. <laughs> My punchline. Yeah, you made that up. I didn't. I don't want up. to steal the air out of the room after you said that. I mean, geez. Well, John uh, said, "Are you sure they didn't say black sax musician?" Yeah. <laughs> that was you made that. Yeah, up. that that was me. Well, you know, I got it somewhere else, probably. Anyways, you know, but you know how these memes float around in the air. Well, you know, I, I mean, that's goes right up there with uh, when I was at the Theosophical Society and and Nidra Books asked, walks up and asks me, are you still doing black magic? And <laughs> I was, still doing what? I looked at her and I said, uh, no, I never did. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> and she backed up, you know, because there, there was all that the schism over the Krishnamurti event in the society. And, and so they bent over backwards to try and, and say bad things about Rudolf Steiner that are based on what? The Rudolf Steiner is a Jesuit. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> his troubles began when he gave his lecture cycle uh, from Jesus to Christ, where he showed the difference between true uh, esoteric Christianity and the Jesuits. And so, uh, well, we fell down that tunnel, but uh, I'm sure Douglas will pull it all together. I, when I did my Jesuit retreat, where you don't speak for 30 days and you stay in a room and they give you food and, and you just do this uh, prayer, there's an antidote to it called Rudolf Steiner's Lectures 
entitled From Jesus to Christ. It's the antidote to the Jesuit Manresa. So I did not do the Jesuit Manresa retreat. I did Steiner's retreat and I had a stack of Steiner books in the room and I thought it was great. But, uh, you know, the, the Jesuit thing is total spiritual materialism, whereas Steiner's thing is uh, showing how uh, the real nature of Christ works. Now, so I'm going to this school, Malama Lama, and it's a great school. It started at a banana field and the lady who started it was really quite a character and her husband. And there was another little one and they were both Waldorf inspired down the street. But she got the guy who owned this huge parcel of land where most of the people live on the east side of uh, the Big Island of Hawaii called Hawaiian Paradise Park, where I lived also, had a beautiful little house. It was it looked like a, um, I don't know, first time I saw it, I thought it was a state park because it was so beautiful. And I ended up buying it and putting a church there called the Yellowbird Church. But anyway, it was with members of the school. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't sign up for the school. I wanted to keep doing investigations, uh, going all over the islands, uh, investigating, you know, going all the way to the top of the mountains, going where no one ever went before. And any time that I'd go around, I'd psychically see things and I'd go, whoa, we're not supposed to go there. Let's go. You know, and I'd go straight over there where there was death, kapu'u, all over it. You could, you could see it rising up into the sky. But anyway, so these one of the teachers there, her name, we're going to call her Debbie. And her husband uh, were just such sweet people. And when they met me, they just, you have to come stay with us. We have a little shack in the back here. You can stay there. So I'm staying with them. And then came along a very strange person. Debbie had met this homeless woman. And this story is going to sound like, you know, Tyler's going to jump in and say, come on, move it along. Okay, she was the most decrepit, homeless, white, old, obese woman with hardly any teeth who you, she could hardly speak. But when she did, it was like you heard angels ringing. But she, I, I hardly heard, you know, a few words out of her mouth and the whole time I knew her. She was living outside near the dump, pulling stuff out of the dump to make herself a little cubby inside of this really thick jungle area near the town of Kao. And so somehow Debbie, my friend, came across her and said, you're coming home with me. You're not staying there. So she brought her home. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. But Debbie, by the way, was probably at that time the best astral psychic on the uh, Big Island. She, she was connected to everybody. Everybody would come to her for psychic readings and she was a Waldorf teacher. And she knew I was psychic. Of course, I knew she was psychic, blah, blah. That's why we, we liked each other. But anyway, here's this old woman, right? And the woman is like, I, I could never understand. Debbie could understand this woman. I'm going to call the old woman Celeste. She could understand Celeste. And what said, no, Douglas, she's like one of the highest spiritual beings I've ever met. I'm going, oh, okay. She was sweet as can be, admittedly. But you couldn't have a conversation with her. Anyway, so she hung out for some time. And then finally, one day, Debbie says, oh, I just got back from meeting the last kahuna. And I'm going, there's no kahunas. There's no more kahunas. What are you talking about? The kahunas died. You know, they killed them all. No, no, the last kahuna, and everyone knows this. Surely you've heard of the Lomi Lomi lady, right? The Lomi Lomi lady. She's the last living kahuna nui, a healing kahuna who uses her voice and ili ili stones, these stones you find that the ocean makes very smooth and beautiful, and she clicks them together and does rhythms that put you into a trance. Or she lays these stones on you and does this healing on you. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll tell you her name. I met her once. I just called her, what was it? Simeona. That's her, her last her last name. Her first name is, um, oh, I wrote it down here just so that you know who I was talking about because there really is a last kahuna. Her name was Mora Simeona. Now, Mora no one knew. It was a rumor that she was alive. It was a rumor that she was in all the islands. As I went around, they go, the Lomi Lomi lady. Uh, oh, you got to meet the Lomi Lomi lady. W well, have you met her? No. <laughs> no one had met her. But everyone knew her, you know. And so I was like, this is crazy. So here's my friend Debbie going, oh, here's the last. Here's the student, the protege of the last kahuna on Hawaii. And I'm like, that's strange. Okay. So. That night, later I got to meet her, got treatments from her, and she treated me like I was her son, and I gave her crystal treatments, and it was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Anyway, 
And she lived in one of the most magical places of all of the islands. And no one went there. No one. It was like a deserted old Hawaiian fishing village. But anyway, this guy's there. I can't remember his name. We'll call him. We won't call him. We'll call him the protege. So the protege is at Debbie's house because somehow Debbie has told him that I do crystal treatments and that I'm some big psychic hoo-ha, whatever. Now, I didn't know that he was on a mission for the last kahuna to find two people. One was a, a homeless woman who fit the description of Celeste, this woman I was describing, to the T even that you couldn't understand her speech, but that she was a Howley, she was a Caucasian and a homeless woman. And what did he give her? He gave her things you can't even, uh, something you can't get in any Hawaiian museum, even though your friend um, Roseanne Barr, remember when we were talking to her and I and she's in this room and I'm going, holy crap, you have the stuff from Queen Lily Okalani's Museum, that's King Kamehameha's sh staff. That's his shield. And she's going, yeah, I bought the whole thing because nobody cared anymore. That's the way it was in Hawaii. Nobody cared anymore. The poor Hawaiian people had been so beaten down, they didn't care. So anyway, he gives to this woman, and it's in our house where we're. I'm staying. I'm staying in the back, but it's in this house, the, la the, the throne of the last kahuna who... Kahuna Simeona got from her teacher. So here's this throne and it's all carved, intricately carved, like cuneiform carved, like you knew it meant something, but you didn't know what. And next to it was a staff. And on that staff was carved this circular history of the whole Polynesian people and the way they came to Hawaii. And then there was this like 20, almost 30 foot long tapa, which is tapa means pounded out bark where they had carved the whole history of 25,920 years. And in places you could see kind of cuneiform looking or really stick figure looking, uh, uh, their boats coming across the ocean following the white shark and all this and all this and all this. And it's all predicted right up to July 11th, 1991. Yeah. And they it, gave it to her. Yeah. Rather than cuneiform, perhaps we should call them uh, ideograms. Yeah. Exactly. Because you could look at it and you go, oh, I kind of know what that's saying to me. So anyway, we had this thing and we had it up on the wall. We had the throne. We had the staff. I sat on it a thousand times and I'm sitting there going, this is utterly cosmic, man. How can this possibly be? And what is this about? Well, what did I call him? The protege is over at the house one night because we became very close friends with him. And he's telling us this long story because he's trying to convince me that I am somebody he keeps calling Kapukani, and I'm going, doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about, but here I'm in the presence of this guy who just gave away probably the most valuable Hawaiian artifact that I've ever heard of or seen. You can't find this in any museum. And to, who did he give it to? A homeless woman. It had to be given away before the total eclipse of the sun on July 11th, 1991, to the exact degree right over the big island of Hawaii. I was there. I witnessed it. It was one of the most expensive. Amazing. And oh, by the way, it was one of the longest ones in human history. So it lasted the longest for some reason. I don't know why. And so he says, he's telling me about this and he's telling me about this history of this star teacher. And I'm thinking, wait a second. This is what Dan told me. He got, uh, discovered from his astro cartography that the star teacher had his Hey, Ow of observation in Pohiki, my favorite place to go where there were hot pools all over the place. I'll tell you about it in a minute. But no one ever found it. And no one ever found his Ohana or his school. And so I started reading up on this and going, well, this is real. Then I got to meet her and I knew it was real because she believed it was real and she was a direct oral tradition. And so one night we're at Debbie's house and her husband's house and where they're talking and I pull out my box of crystals because I guess I hadn't done that yet. So I pull them out and I show him this crystal. Now this crystal has fallen and broken into four pieces. One of the only crystals I've ever broken and it was one of my favorite given to me by Jimmy Coleman, the miner down in Arkansas, one of the biggest miners of quartz crystal in the world. He sets the 
price of clear quartz crystal by what he does with the market, all that he digs up. And we're in a room, a big warehouse, where every single crystal is perfect. Perfect. No milkiness to them. Absolutely like water. And there's hundreds and giant ones and just amazing crystals I've ever seen. And so he's saying, you know, Doug, you've done so much good work for me. He goes, you know, I wish I could. I'm just going on about the crystals. I wish I could just give you all these crystals because you really appreciate me. He goes, oh, look at that. And he walks over and he picks up this crystal. It's held together with rubber bands. I only put this together this morning. I don't know if you can see the shape of this. How can I get my fingers out of the way? I don't know if you can see the shape of it. But when I picked it up, I went, because, oh, you see this milky part right there? Oh, really milky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this crystal is, oh, this crystal is priceless because of its shape, okay? Uh, and so he hands it to me, and I look at it and go, yeah, thanks, Jimmy. You're giving me a phallus. And he goes, Oh, yeah, I guess it is. I didn't mean to give you a veil. So he goes, I gave it to you because it's got milky stuff on the end. I can't use it. How did it even get in here? So he gives it to me. It was one of my most precious crystals. I show this to the protege. He goes out of his mind. He goes, that's when he said, I have to take you to see uh, my kahuna. And I'm like, why? He goes, you just brought the sacred aqua stone back. Uh, and that's the sign. That means you are the person I've been saying you are, Kapu Kahi. And I'm like, I have no no rec recollection of any of what you're talking about. This stone was given to me by a dear friend, and uh, I don't ever use it in healing. I just have it because I use it as a joke. You know, I it, it, when I want to pull a joke, I hand it to somebody and say, or just see what they say, right? And they always... <laughs> We say, oh, here, take it back. Okay. Right then, I'm so blown away when he says that the all his his mission is complete because now, before uh after the total eclipse, there's going to be a meeting on a Kao, the largest Kao, the largest raised platform where they had the temples where they did human sacrifice. And don't forget that just a few hundred years ago, the Hawaiians were eating each other. Now, people don't, they never will say that out loud. The Hawaiians and the Polynesians were cannibals. And they loved to eat the heart and the liver of anyone they'd conquer. And so they worshiped a god called Ku, a very long name, Ku Awaiyaiopui or something, you know, but it's Ku. So they worship Ku, the god of war. And they worship blood. And in these heiaus, they made human sacrifice. Well, this, we're going to call him star teacher. This star teacher was the guy leading them from the Polynesian islands, looking at the Pleiades all the way to Hawaii. And the, people say, how did they cross the ocean? Because he was their navigator. Then when he got there, he was on all the islands, but then he settled in on the big island because it was the best for observation because he could go way up the tall mountains, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, and go up into the starry heavens and do his, his work there. Okay, so he was then reincarnated. So according to the story, some Hawaiians are reincarnated. Some aren't, the way the story goes. So he was reincarnated in around 17... 91, there was uh, basically King uh, Kamehameha was about to, uh, he had just conquered all the islands and then he lost all of it. And then they were coming, they came to the big island and they were coming after him. And so he went to the prophet who had left the big island because King Kamehameha and his cousin were at war with one another. The island was always at war. And so they called the prophet back. He came back to the big island. King Kamehameha said, I, I got to end this. How do I end this? I, I just want peace. And he says, well, if you'll promise peace, I'll do a ritual and I will create a special, um, well, there's a prophecy that he gave at that time. And it's written down. So this is not made up. And it's real. I didn't know it was real until afterwards. And now I know it's real because I can look it up on the internet. But the point is, is that the star teacher told Kamehameha, if you will call your cousin here after you build this great, basically that was their temple. It's a, it's the biggest one. It's on the big island. It's a, I can even tell you the name in case you're interested in looking at it. 
it's not a place you go to because when I go to those places and get up on top of the Heiau, I feel the human sacrifice. So I'd been on that thing. And I said, I'm not going to back, go back up there because there was human sacrifice happened there. But I didn't know that it was just one person. It was his cousin. Kamehameha got in a fight with his cousin as they were trying to create peace, killed him, and then did not follow the star teacher's lesson or prophecy and burnt him instead of burning a pig. And that's why luau's. Pigs replace human sacrifice. And so when you go to Hawaii and you're eating the pig, just be glad it's not a human anymore. And so he was supposed to then change all rituals as the king over to no human sacrifice, only sacrifice of pigs. But then he kills his cousin, sacrifices his cousin. The star teacher gets mad at him. And let me give you the name of this place. It's in um, Kauai. It's called the Hill of the Whale. And the exact name of it is Pu'ukohala. And it's a heiau, and you can go there. There's nothing on it, just the stones. It's a massive undertaking to build this thing. And so the star teacher comes there and says, what are you doing, King Kamehameha? You've totally blown it. You're out of your mind. You wanted peace. Well, if you still promise me peace, because I understand that, you know, your cousin had been bothering you for a long time, creating, you know, your worst enemy, your worst nemesis. He says, I will promise you 200 years of peace if you promise that you will put your weapons down and there will be no more war from here on out among the Hawaiian people. And King Kamehameha swore to that. And this is the part that gets a little dicey. Then the star teacher cut off his genitalia and threw it in the sacrificial fire where the cousin was burning to say, I'm making this sacrifice because I'm going to reincarnate in 200 years when there's a total eclipse of the sun on a certain day and he, he named it in the Hawaiian calendar. And it turns out to be the exact day of the total eclipse. And so he says, I'm making a sacrifice here, but what's going to happen is when I return, I will bring an Akaua, A-K-U-A, -A, Aqua Stone. And Aqua Stone is like the idols that they have. Sometimes they're just a phallus. That's all they are, a stone about this big, and it's a phallus, and they sit on the hay house. Matter of fact, you don't touch them. And anybody who ever did touch them brings them back because they're that cursed. Nobody ever takes these, okay? And they sit out open in public in places where, you know, you could take them. Matter of fact, I was part of a group that gathered a few of these uh, through a ritual they did to bring all of the aqua stones to Kalapana Black Sand Beach. And we put them on an altar there and no one ever touched them or bothered them because they're that powerful. And I'm not kidding. Some of them are horrible, fierce faces. Some are just phallus. Some are just weird rocks that you say that did not come from Hawaii. It could have been a meteorite. Don't know. Anyway, we gathered those together. And so the star teacher said, you will know me when, when I come back just before this total eclipse of the sun, because I will bring with me the new Akoa stone. And we will throw it and I will throw it in the ocean. In other words, he's saying, I'll, I'll take the most valuable thing that we have in our whole religion and throw it in the ocean. So here I come with this, show it to the guy. And he goes, that's the stone. I said, well, you ain't throwing my stone in the ocean, okay? I'll just tell you that right now. Ain't no way. We're gonna, we'll work something out. So I go outside. And I'm standing there realizing what he said. And I'm staring up into the sky. It's night and there's stars and there's nothing there. There's no moon, nothing. And I'm staring up into this. I'm standing there for a while. A couple of people come out of the house and say, what are you doing? I said, I, I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. I'm just staring into the sky. And then uh, two of them are standing there. So three of us are standing there. And all of a sudden, a light appears in the sky as big as the moon. And all of us just f practically fall back. Whoa, the moon just appeared. Full moon, big as a full moon. Where did that come from? And this is right where you're staring. They're going, why, why is this happening? Is this the end times? And they're going on about this is the end times. They literally thought the apocalypse had come, right? And then it exploded. The whole moon-looking thing that was as bright as a full moon, which was in the wrong part of the sky for a full moon, by the way, exploded in all directions. And we, I fall over. I fall to the ground. They're like, they're stumbling. And it's like, oh, my God, we're screaming and telling the people to come out. And 
and they come out and they're going, what's your problem? You can still see it, it, uh, the explosion and everybody's going, oh my God, it's the end of times. The moon has exploded. It's the end of time. We're certain. <laughs> so we go inside. So we just turn on the radio, see if they're announcing the end of time. Nothing, nothing. It takes like two weeks for them to announce that it was a barium bomb that they exploded over Oahu as they were doing missile tests from Barking Sands and Kauai, uh, sending missiles, and they were trying to stop radar from sensing them. But it didn't matter. I walked out there, and the moon appeared and then exploded right in front of all of us. And I'm going, okay, this is real. So this is a sign. Something's going on. So I go, and I take the phallic stone to the kahuna. And she looks at it. She's, no, my protege is right. You are him. That is the stone. And you have to throw it in the ocean. I said, no, 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 no. Here's, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm not throwing this thing away. This is my precious stone. And I was very, and this is bad because this is exactly what this whole thing is all about. It's called the passing ceremony when the Hawaiians had to give their land away because they stole it from the Minahuni, according to mythology, and then fought over it the whole time they were there until the star teacher convinced Kamehameha to stop fighting and so, uh, you know, this was uh, the, uh, there was a whole movement that the Hawaiian people wanted all their land back because it was illegally annexed in 1998. They said it was illegally annexed and it belongs to the Hawaiians and the Hawaiians can kick us all off and it doesn't belong to America. That's the law. So there was a movement to take it back and it went crazy, this movement. It went on for years and years and years and it was even getting violent. Well, the message that the last kahuna had was, listen to the star teacher. We have to go towards peace. Mother Nature, Pele, it's on the big island, that's Pele, the goddess. We have to turn towards peace and not war. And the, when the uh, aqua stone shows up and the star teacher comes, as he said he would, then we will um, do this passing ceremony and we're going to give, we've already given the chair, the throne of the last kahuna, the, ta the tapa, of the history of the Polynesians and the Hawaiians and the staff to this woman. So they went to that heiau where all that happened with Kamehameha and his cousin, and they had a passing ceremony after the big total eclipse. And they gave it all to this woman. <laughs> they gave all their Hawaiian holdings because there's no more relatives of Kamehameha or um, uh, Liliokalani or uh, none of them. So they gave it to what they call a haole, a white person. And and then the star teacher was supposed to be there and throw the stone in the ocean. Well, here's what I did. After the eclipse, which was the most amazing thing, it was unbelievable. Literally, a curtain of black fell. You could see the stars above you, sunlight on the other side. It was the spookiest thing ever, I'm telling you. And so, and it was right over that heyow. That's how the star teacher chose that heyow, that hill of the whale to build that heyow. That's exactly where it was. So everybody else, all over the islands were so disappointed because it was rainy and it was cloudy and they didn't get to see it. Uh -uh, not if they would have done what they were supposed to do, which is go to that heyow. We were just a little bit above it. And it was perfect, just right there right in the perfect exact strip. We got to see this. And then after that, I said, I'm getting the heck out of Hawaii because now this, I'm shortening my seven year stay there because I got so sick from the volcano that I was going to leave. And I didn't want to be there because I knew that something was going to die. And if supposedly I was that person who cut off my genitalia and threw it in the fire, what am I going to do this time? <laughs> so I didn't want to be there. So I say to the kahuna, Nui, I say, I'm going to take this and I'm going to go to the city of refuge and I'm going to do what you do in the ancient days, which is if you killed somebody by accident or you did a horrible crime that, that is punishable by death, if you could cross the big island of Hawaii without them killing you because they'd be chasing you the whole way and you got to the city of refuge and then you dove into the most shark infested waters in all of Hawaii and swam out to this island and tagged, got on the island, you were innocent. And I said, that's what I'm going to do with the stone. I'll take it there and I'll put it there and I'll bury it for a while and come back and get it later and, you know, and see what, and I think that'll do it because I'm not going to be here. 
uh, Simeone. Now she last she she died a few months after that after that passing ceremony, which she's the one who helped create this, and it actually stopped that movement for the Hawaiians to, in some cases, get aggressive to take their land back. And so, in a way, it really did do what it was supposed to do. Now, that's the historical story. And one might think, okay, that is a bunch of caca because they could have made that up. You know, that's it. But uh, in a second, as soon as John tells us what he thinks, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story, which I think will uh, convince you because it certainly convinced me. Well, that, again you have all these ancient prophecies of these cultures that were drawing their inspiration out of the realm of the exousiae the, the, and, the, and working through the spirits of form, the, the, the realm of the Elohim. But there's all the Elohim aren't the same. There's seven primary ones. And then you have the uh, inverse or, or retarded Elohim uh, and and there's a great contention between all these various things, like that that gets to the story of of uh, Cain and Abel, and uh, the whole idea of diving into the fiery pit to find Cain. Right, that's in the story of Hiram Abiff, you know, in in the temple legend. And so, what is that when you get into trying to understand that that before Christ, there were mysteries all over the world. They, they, they did human sacrifice and, and blood sacrifice. It was a big thing to propitiate uh, beings of the spirits of form and that they felt that intelligence would stream to them from these great beings. But with the incarnation of Christ, that whole uh, Mars impulse came to a close. So you have the turning point of time. And now the uh, inspiration of consciousness has moved from the realm of the Elohim into the realm of the Archai, uh, the realm of which Michael, since he has translated to the realm of the Archai, is the leading uh, impulse that, that those are forward-looking follow. Now, that's all difficult. It's some of you are going to have to go back and have to listen to what I said <laughs> again. I understand that, but there's a lot of people here that have been following this for a while, and I think they have some idea what I'm talking about. But that being said, so that now there are, are beings that are attempting to push us to old dis dispensations, so to speak. And the Christ is the new dispensation. God is love, and that he sacrificed himself for all of mankind, so we don't have to bother with all these types of, of sacrificial acts that these other cultures believe that, that they're going to receive power from. And there's still people in the dark sectors of modern society that are still invoking these types of dark impulses. And so it's just important to have some backstory to, to try and understand, because it was to make the transition from the god of war to the god of, of cultivation and culture and the life process rather than the death process. Absolutely. That's exactly the point. Now, the bad news is, is that the uh, Captain Cook and his British pirates came and tried to foist uh, Christianity on them in such a horrible way that they literally murdered them. They they planted uh, OPs and uh, all these thorn bushes so they'd have to put shoes on. They made them wear clothes. They made them uh, take the uh, aqua stones and throw them in the ocean and kill the kahunas. It was, it was a mess. But the point is, is that they were at the end, like the Mayan calendar. Each of these great civilizations map out the 25,920 year cycle or a half cycle of that or a quarter cycle of that. And that's what this map did. And basically it said, we need to end the old ways and we need to go just as John said, from the war God, Ku to the agricultural uh, and God of beauty, Lono. So anyway, uh, the proof of this for me was very strange because here I am traveling around the islands. I'm doing all these strange things, going to amazing places and just, going in places I wasn't supposed to go. So I knew I was taking upon me curses 
all kinds of death curses, kapu'u death curses, because, and I'll, we'll talk about that next time. Uh, and also the animals, learning how to talk to the uh, marine life in, in Hawaii was really a huge step. But this was a step for myself to understand, I guess, my mission in life. So anyway, I tried to decide which school do I want to go to. I'd been offered a job uh, on Oahu at Punulu'u, which is the uh, largest endowment of any private school in America. That's where Barack Obama, a.k.a. Barry Soretto, went to school. And so they offered me a job there. I was like, okay, you can't live on Oahu. It's too expensive. So I said no. Got offered a job at... Uh, on Maui. And I said no for a variety of reasons. Then I got offered a job at Hawaii Preparatory Academy, which is up on the saddle between the two big mountains. They have their own airport. Almost every child who comes there comes from foreign countries and they have their own pilots and their own jets. And so they built their own airport and they have a riding school where the horses are, you know, a million dollar horses that they ride on. So they offered me a job there and I'm like, I don't think this is quite my cup of tea. Uh, so I didn't take that. Uh, and then I finally was saying, leaning towards Malama Lama. And then someone says to me, who's a teacher there, Douglas, and she's a Krishna. She believes in Krishna. And I love this woman. She's beautiful. And she comes to me. She was, oh, she was one of the 12 women that I was having black um, sex magic with. And she comes to me, she says, Douglas, strange, and her eyes were ready to pop out of her head. Strange thing happened to me last night. God came to me. I mean, like the Christian God came to me. I don't even believe in him. He came to me and said, I have to give you this little shack behind my house to live in. And I'm like, sounds cool to me because I've been bouncing around all over. I said, sure. She told me where it was. And I said, you know, is anything like this happening? No, 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 it hasn't. But you're a Krishna. Why wasn't a Krishna? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, later, I helped her found the Kona School. When she moved out of the other big house, there's a big house, a little house. I lived in the little house and the big house. She moved over to the Kona side, the Kailua Kona, the Gold Coast. And we helped found, I helped her found the Kona Walter School with some millionaires over that side of the island. So she gives me this little house. Well, the first thing I notice when I drive into the driveway is, Holy man, whatever, look, there's a jungle with an untouched, ancient, hundreds of years old ohana with a heiau right next door. And you can tell no one's ever walked in it. It's never been walked in and it is untouched. Well, this doesn't happen because they dig these things up for very good reasons. And people, when they find them, they tell the university and they come just like when I found the platform for the Hey Owl for the star teachers observation, right? I told the university of Hawaii, they came out, they looked at it and they went, yeah, yeah, this, this would be him. That's that. Yeah. We don't know how this stone was carved. We don't even know what kind of stone it is. It was a huge, big platform of a stone that was one solid piece. Now, of course, People are going to say it's aliens, right? And they say, you know, no, not aliens. It's something magical. I don't know how it happened. And no one could find this. We had to go deep into this forest with machetes. And I wondered whether we'd ever get out when we finally came across this. I was following my intuition. We found this place. We turn it in, just like Pele's vagina. See, this is a lava tube that's formed into what's called Pele's vagina. There's three of these in this one site that Paul Mitchell owns in those days. And I would take people down there because the women, would, they were doing rituals for birthing here. And we turned it in and uh, to the Hawaii, uh, to the university. They came out, they investigated, did blah, 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 blah. And they put a gate on it to make sure people couldn't go down anymore. But Paul had a key and I had a key. But anyway, so this is, going from Pele's vagina to on the island of Maui, there's a phallic pinnacle 1,200 feet tall called Io. So the stone, the Aku'u stone of the star teacher was called Io because it's an idol and that was a god. And uh, aqua stones are gods to the Hawaiians. So this stone I had was a god to them. Uh, but anyway, so I, I'm pulling in the driveway. I look over there and I go, this is utterly incredible. Okay, I get out and I walk over towards it. And in the daytime, I see what the Hawaiians call, 
uh, night marchers or night watchers. They have a number of names for them. It's a group of people with torches walking in the dark towards something. And it's supposed to be a sign, the, the most terrifying sign of divinity and Every, you know, just everything. It's supposed to shake you up. You, you, people, if they see the night watchers, they sometimes go nuts. So here I am, daylight, boom, I start seeing them and I'm going, oh, what is this? This is an untouched little village with 25 little buildings. They're all, of course, all collapsed and stuff. And and a little hay owl for offering there. And so I, I say, yes, this, I, 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 I go into the backyard. It's just this nice house like a five bedroom house, a uh, ranch. And then I go to the backyard and it's so overgrown. It's such a jungle, but there's like 70 foot tall um, monkey pod trees and things in the backyard. And there's this little cabin. It doesn't even have one room. The shower is outdoors. You, no one can see you. It's completely surrounded by a jungle. And it's a tiny little thing. Matter of fact, the room I'm in right now is no bigger than that thing. And it was like a meditation cabin or something with an elevated bed and a desk. And, uh, you know, and so I said, well, yeah. She goes, I want to give this to you. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm happy to pay for it. I got lots of money. No, no, no. God told me, the Christian God, she always made it. The Christian God told me I have to give you this place. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, who's been living here before? Nobody. I don't want anybody here. So, but I'll let you hear. So that became the house I was living in next to this. Well, like that that segues into this next little section quite well because she was a, a devotee of Krishna and another devotee of Krishna. I misspoke about last episode because, uh, well, you know, because I've done one degree procession of the equinox and I, I that's my privilege. <laughs> but uh, Paramahansa, that means he's seventy, folks. I said I I just offhandedly said that that Paramahansa Yoga Nanda. Uh, passed away in the late 70s, but that wasn't the case, of course. Uh, he passed away, uh, it was on uh, uh, March 7th, 1952, he, and uh, he was born on January 5th, 1893. But that being said, Yogananda became very uh, kind of upset because people kept saying bad things about him when he came to America, Christians did. And he went into tears and he meditated, he meditated, and Jesus came to him and said, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, it's okay, you know, you, you have my blessing, you're doing good things. And so uh, the Lord does appear to people that are not members of uh, churches. I just thought people might want to know that. <laughs> and declares himself as the Christian God. Yes, and, and that just tells you that I think Paramahasa Yogananda's body was like 30 years old when I uh, saw it in the glass case with it's open at the bottom, incorrupt, still smells like flowers. Well, look, you, you're talking about Hawaii and all of this. Um, what about Lahaina and the current events that are going on here? Won't that disrupt these, the spiritual beings there in Hawaii? There's such curses. And, in and, Hawaii, and then what would these happen? people are going to go down? Just like I wasn't. It sounds like I was making a joke about these people. Uh, uh I'm not making a joke. If you literally took Hawaiian rock away from Hawaii, you better put it back. Well, they're just stealing you, all the rock. They're just they steal everything. the whole island. Oh, everything! They rip it off. The poor Hawaiian people. It, it's 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 a say, disgrace. They say that with that event that many more Hawaiian people with uh, uh, Hawaiian origins were murdered just so that the land could be seized. Totally. So let's go back to this. Can the Hawaiians collectively get together and say sorry and kick the United States and all these billionaires off their island? Anytime. It's already been decided. Okay. But, but they can't because what? FEMA, which is the circo arm of the British Pilgrim Society, and King Charles the Third has got claim on the island, so that's where they're going to move. I mean, this is just an abomination of the authenticity and the the uh, future of the Hawaiian people. The program was called Jumps Smart, and it was it's it's a targeted city in Lahaina because it's easy to control. It's easy to control all factors involved. They could do this. Now, let me go on with the story because I only got six more minutes. So. 
first thing I do is I move into this house and I build a tree house 70 feet up in a, in a monkey pond tree. And nobody can go up there. So sometimes I have to pull them up. It's three stages. And so I'm up there in a hammock and I'm looking around and I look over oh, across the way because this is still jungle. I mean, on the one mile strip of this road in between two other roads, there's only like two houses, three, four, maybe three, four houses maximum. So here I am in this house next door to the most preserved ancient Ohana in all of Hawaii, untouched. And every time I get near it and I put my foot on that property, I go into a tra vision, trance, whatever, to the point that I back off. Matter of fact, I never did walk around it because I knew I had something to do with it. I was buried there is the story, but that's not the point. The point is I'm up in the treehouse and look over and I see this huge uh, banyan tree. And I'm thinking, a banyan tree out here in Paradise Park? How is that possible? So I get down, go through the jungle. I have to go all the way over, go to the jungle. And I come to this huge banyan tree and I find a road that leads there. And there's no houses, nothing. Nobody's there. And I'm looking at this banyan tree going, this is the oldest banyan tree on the island. I know the banyan trees on the island, all the islands because they had to be planted there. So I'm looking at this thing going, why would it be here? Oh, it's connected to the Ohana. It's connected to the Heiau. And then I start looking around on the ground and, and, and with my machete cutting stuff off. And I find what ultimately turned and it took a lot to clear this off. Into the lava rock is carved an exact topographical map of the big island in ultra detail. And I'm like, okay, that's it. There's only one reason anyone would ever do this under this banyan tree. This was the place that the star teacher had his school. And that's his Ohana. And so I pulled it all off, let the university come out. They looked at it. They looked at the uh, Ohana uh, and they said to me, we know about that. What do you think we're stupid? We don't touch it. It's sacred. That belonged to, <laughs> then they said this. And of course, I didn't even connect that that is the star teacher or some, most of the time that people would say this, it'd go in. And then, you know, now it's taken, I don't know how many years, 30 years to figure it out. Um, Kapukai says, that is the Ohana. We don't touch it. It's sacred. He was our sacred teacher. And because of him, we have peace. And so we're not going to disturb him or his family or his school and yes, the banyan tree was planted by him. And yes, that is a map that he used to teach the children the topology of the big island. At that moment, I said to myself, okay, that's it. I'm staying here forever. I guess this is my fate. So I go back to my little cabin and I'm standing there. And all of a sudden, I get vertigo which I had a little bit of that, not much. And then I get a second and a third and a fourth stage. And then I fall to the ground and start vomiting. And then I go into nine levels of vertigo for three days, completely awake, where I see all the levels of hell, experience them, burnt alive, certain I'm dead, or, but I'm still conscious. I But I had given up my body days before. And so after... Uh, so I went all the way down very slowly and very slowly came up again. And just when I get back and I'm looking and I'm just about okay, uh, one of the teachers comes, the teacher comes in, knocks on my door and because she hadn't seen me for days. And then she looks in, sees me on the floor and comes in and there's blood and vomit and blood coming out of my eyes and ears and nose and everything. And uh, so she calls 911. They take me to the hospital and they say, uh, yeah, you have some kind of rare um, parasite called, well, not rare. You have Giardia and some other parasites we can't identify. And um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, no big deal. You'll be fine. Over the next three months, I go from 110 pounds to 265 pounds. <laughs> I, I become, I look like I become a kahuna, like I become the ali'i. In those days, the heavier you were, the, the bigger you were, and so they would drink coconut milk, you know, coconut cream all the time so that they would get fat. So the fatter you were, the more royal you were. You were part of the ali'i. So I fell down, and after three days, I got up, and, and then all these tumors started to grow. 
I grew fat. I was never, John, you remember how I, people used to say, man, you were a, you're a skeleton. You need to eat, man. You need to get off that stupid vegetarian diet, you know, because I really looked like I was Skeletor or something. But <laughs> boom, 265 pounds. And I said, that's it. I have now become a Hawaiian. I'm staying. I'm staying here for the rest of my life. So here we are. Uh, and again, these are such big stories that you see that you're going to have to uh, develop the story further, but we're running out of time. But I, I just wanted to put a little footnote here is that what, well, what is the authority for this, this globalist intrigue that we're seeing? It goes back to a papal bull that was issued by Pope Boniface the, the 8th and uh, 18th of November, 1302. And it, it's called Unam Sanctam, and it asserts uh, over the world, not only the ecclesiastical authority, but the secular authority. So that the legal basis of, of contractual maneuvers uh, for the crown and for the pilgrim society and this whole uh, legalism that, that we're being put upon, that, that this is this is the root. It, 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 literally, if you take it back to the history of the court system and all that, it goes back to the authority that's given by this. And they they talked about dividing the, the world under various domains of authority. And so that's the world we're living in today. And so there, so maybe we can explore that further. But uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming along on this adventure and, and geez, these stories are so huge. We, we can't seem to move to the next chapter, but that's okay because it's actually all quite fascinating. And so we could see that if we could just guide ourselves to, to that understanding that God is love and that the reason you don't see the light is because you are the light. And I want to thank Lady Tyler for putting all this together and her brilliant contributions. And I want to thank Dr. Douglas Gabriel. Aloha. <laughs>